Luke chapter number 18, and uh, we're going to try to uh, to get as far as we can tonight. We'll read another uh, section of Scripture over in the book of Proverbs as well, and uh, that'll be over in Proverbs chapter number 6. Uh, I've, I've been, over the last several services, been trying to print out um, the outline that, that I use, but this one is... I've made so many notes on it, even on my iPad, there's no way that you'd be able to make heads or tails of it, so I just didn't do that tonight. Uh, but if you would like any clarification, just feel free to ask. Luke chapter number 18, verse number 10. Didn't the youngins do a good job tonight? Amen. Amen. I love it. And uh, I like I like hearing it. And uh, I... I well, I, I ain't going to say nothing else because I don't feel like crying tonight. Luke chapter 18, verse number 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a, a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, uh, where are we at? Adulterers or even as this publican. He says, I fast in the week, twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift so much up as his voice, good, not so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, if you want to turn over to the book of Proverbs, chapter number 6, verse number 16, uh, we'll read these few verses. It says in verse number 16, Proverbs 6, These six things... Doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Let's look at that very first phrase there in verse 17. A proud look. He goes on, he says, A lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, And he that soweth discord among the brethren. Let's pray just for a moment and get on into the message. Dear God, we thank you for this day and for all your blessings. God, we want to take just a second and say thank you for the rain. Lord, it's it's been dry over the last several weeks. And God, we thank you, Lord, for allowing that rain to come in and do what nature needs to be done. God, we pray now that you'd help us keep everybody safe on the road. God, we know that first rain can make the roads dangerous, so we do pray, God, that you'd help us there. God, we ask you now that you'd help the Word of God tonight to become alive to us. I pray that you'd hide us behind the cross of Calvary this evening. God, we pray that you'd touch our voices. Lord, I pray you'll touch my mind, give us clarity of speech tonight. We thank you we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We were dealing with this giant of pride tonight. We started it last Sunday night, and we got through the introduction, and I'm not going to recap that, but I want to read this phrase. As we approach this giant, the question is not, does this giant exist in my life, but rather, where does this giant exist in my life? And uh, each of us can look kind of in the, the depths of darkness in our hearts, and we could see pride Somewhere, just sitting on that front pew, uh, I had pride because these young folks got up in here and sang. I had pride that it was my wife playing for them. I had pride that it was my daughter was one of the girls singing. And those can all be healthy um, examples of pride. But if we're not careful, even those healthy examples of pride can sneak in and we can become, uh, as the Scripture said, we can have that proud look about us. We can have that thing that God abhors, He hates. That's that pride in our hearts. We read Scriptures last week, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. 
When we read over there in Philippians chapter 2 about Christ, He was found in fashion as a man and humbled Himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We told you that pride's ultimate goal is to preserve self, to protect self, and to promote self. Now, especially in these days of social media, it seems as though that's the prerequisite. Uh, if you're going to have a social media account, you you need to preserve yourself, you need to protect yourself, and you need to promote yourself. That's one. Re- well, that's three reasons why I can't stand it. I'm on there, but I can't stand it. If I ever think I have a good thought and I put it on there, I end up messing everything up. So uh, sometimes it's better just to not have it. Somebody say amen right there. But uh, it, it seems like in this day and time that we live, it's very easy to fall into those three things. You, you protect yourself, you promote yourself, you preserve yourself. But we're dealing with pride. And we've got to start, number one, with the problem of pride. And we'll give you a few things about this problem of pride. First, we see it defined. The definition of pride is that which defends and commends self while it offends and contends with God. Y'all need to hear that again. We're talking about this giant of pride. It is that which defends and commends self while it offends and contends with God. I was watching, maybe I told, uh, was it, I think maybe Samuel the other night, about Evander Holyfield. He'd come out of retirement to to fight. What was that guy's name? What he said. And he got whooped is what happened. He got knocked out. But I, I watched a video of him getting adjusted by a chiropractor and I mean, he's in his 60s, I think, and he's still just big. I mean, he's strapping man. And I thought, man, if I saw him in a dark alley and made him mad, he whooped me 30 ways from Sunday. I know he would. But he come against somebody that was bigger than he was. And, and that's what pride is. As big as we think that we are, as much as we promote ourselves, uh, if we're not careful, pride itself, the giant of pride, will even overcome our own and we will, as the scriptures say, we will become haughty and fall. And so this definition of pride, it says that it commends itself while it contends with God. So if you can, if you can imagine yourself spiritually speaking, when this giant of pride begins to gain traction in your life, and this giant of pride becomes overwhelming in your life, you are at enmity with God. You are contending with God. And uh, it, it's not a good place to be. Pride is hidden when it is coddled, and it flares when its demands are denied. We had two little tea tiny babies in here this morning, and they were just perfect. I'm talking about, they were per- I didn't hear a peep out of them. I don't remember hearing a peep out of Josie. I mean, she's near about the prettiest thing that's ever walked outside of Ashland and Braylon. I'm telling you what's true. And maybe Lori, but I didn't know her when she was a baby. I knew Leah when she was a baby, so she, she was ugly. But, um, we, we, we look at these little babies and we think, man, how, how precious they are and how pretty they are. And I walked up to, 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 I'm going to have a hard time saying Danny to, 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 Brother Eric's baby, and uh, went down there, and I grabbed his toes, and I felt five little toes on both feet, and I reached up and I grabbed his little hands, and he had five fingers on every, on, not on every, but on both hands, and and he just seemed perfect and had beautiful skin and everything, and I thought, my soul, what a blessing to have that little baby, and they're so quiet, so content, but they're just like pride. Did you hear what I said about pride? It is hidden when it is coddled. You don't even know that it's there. Those babies, as long as they're satisfied, they're dry, they're full, they're being held, being coddled, they don't cause a problem in the world. But you neglect their demands, and everybody will know that they are there. If that one of those babies, or Josie, or some of you, you get too hungry... 
you're going to be saying, hey, it's time to go. Let's, let's go. And you're going to be amening me just to get me to shut up. And those little babies will start screaming and they'll start crying. And, and I'll just tell you my stance on it. Let them, let them cry. It ain't going to bother me at all. I promise you. Just let them be babies. If you can help them, help them. But don't, don't think for a minute it's going to bother me. That's free. But pride is hidden when it's coddled and it flares when its demands are denied. It easily finds fault in others and struggles to give genuine praise. It is hellish in every form. Pride will sit back while... Uh, I don't know why I always come, come to this, but pride will sit back. I love to hear... My wife play, and I love to hear Brother David play, and I love to hear Miss Tanya play, and other piano players. And I'll sit back, and I'll watch them play, and if I'm up here, I'll watch their hands, and they're doing all the right stuff. And my wife so gingerly put it last night that every time I get down to the piano, I play the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I looked at it, I said, I'm not a piano player! I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't play introductions. I just room and then sing whatever it is I'm going to sing. And that room all sounds the same, Brother D. It don't matter if it's Amazing Grace or some other weird song. It all sounds the same. But I love hearing these musicians. And I could sit there and I can allow pride to get into my heart. And I, I will begin to compare my own talent or the lack thereof to theirs and pride will creep in, and though they are at the top of their game, I cannot acknowledge their skill. I cannot acknowledge. Maybe another preacher comes in, and he's he's deeper, and he's smarter, and he he. I mean, he's better. He's funnier. He's all of. The, I mean, he's just he's just the best in every way. And I could sit there and no matter how much I enjoy, no matter how much I glean from what he's saying, if I'm not careful and allow pride to come into my heart, then I will find fault in him no matter what he does and will struggle to give praise to someone else. Pride takes many forms, but its goal is always the exaltation of self. Proverbs chapter number 8, verse number 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. Pride takes many forms. And self, pride, must win. Listen to this. God's hatred for pride is pure. And it comes from His holiness. Exodus chapter number, I won't say it's chapter 17, around verse number 20. I may be completely wrong. It may be chapter number 20, verse number 17. But He says that God is a jealous God. And He's the only one that has a right to be jealous. It is not that verse. I don't know exactly where that's at. God's the only one that has a right to be jealous. He created everything else. But Brother Deke, even in his jealousy, he is holy. Amen. And because he is holy, and because he knows what he expects his creation to do, and what they should not do, then his pride and ours are on two different planes. Listen. Amen. God's hatred for pride is pure and it comes from His holiness. It is that which makes Him actively, positionally, and constantly opposed to those who succumb to this giant of pride. James chapter number 4, verse number 6 but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Amen. We look over in First Peter chapter 5, verse 5 again. We read that in the introduction. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. We're still talking about 
the definition of this problem of pride. This word resisteth in 1 Peter 5 and in James chapter 4, it means that God opposes the proud. He positions himself opposite the person walking in pride. It means to oppose as in battle. We mentioned Evander Holyfield just a little while ago. So let's just take for a moment, God is in one corner and you are in the other. And your spirit is filled with pride. And you've got to fight God. Who do you think is going to win? Not a whole lot of question in that little battle. And so God positions himself opposite of the person walking in pride. Jonathan Edwards called pride the worst viper that is in the heart and the greatest disturber of the soul's peace and sweet communion with Christ. Pride is is one of those sins, if you will, that you really don't even know you're doing. It will slip in in such a way that you, when you realize that the fellowship with God is broken... You're looking around and you're saying, now God, I don't know what I've done. I I, I don't remember going anywhere, shouldn't I? Don't remember saying anything, shouldn't I? Don't remember this, that, or the other. God, what's the problem? And all of a sudden, that still small voice would begin to shake the foundations of our soul. And he'll begin to talk about that giant of pride that has crept in unaware. Jonathan Edwards, he ranked pride as one of the most difficult sins to root out and the most hidden, secret, and deceitful of all lusts. He said, what a foolish, silly, miserable, blind, deceived, poor worm am I when pride works. One writer said, pride ruins pastors and churches more than any other thing. I'll tell you how it can ruin a pastor. This is the one that we... There's a few things that we see. Uh, One deals with money. The other deals with uh, relationships. And things may start out very simple. And things may start out very, uh, uh, very innocent, if you will. But before long, they people begin to dabble in things they ought not dabble in. And that's why I, I am diametrically opposed to messing with the money and and knowing what people give because I don't want it to influence my relationship with you. I don't want it to influence how I preach to you. If I ever start preaching at you instead of to you, then I've crossed the line. Y'all hear me now. Not only that, but with relationships. That's why I refuse to be in a building or in a room with someone other than my wife, a female other than my wife, because I don't want there to be some confusion about what could be happening there. But the reason that it affects so many pastors and preachers and men is because we think, well, it's just an innocent conversation. No one needs to know about it. Or it's just an innocent pat on the back. Or an innocent hug around the neck. No one needs to know. It was innocent. Nothing going on. And that lends to the door opening a little wider. And a little wider. And instead of no one needs to know, the phrase becomes, no one will ever find out. And when you begin to entertain that thought of no one will ever... Y'all better hear me. This ain't got nothing to do with the message, but I got to say it. When you begin to entertain the thought that no one will ever find out, you, my friend, have already crossed the line and you better put it in reverse. And you better find a way that you can get things right with God, with the church, with the wife, with the whatever it is. Because when you begin to say that, when you begin to say, uh, no one will ever find out, that already means that you've got something to hide. So this idea of pride, it will, it will ruin pastors. And unfortunately, it's a trickle down effect. It will ruin churches. More than any other thing. 
Another writer said, pride is the dandelion of the soul. Its roots go deep. Only a little left behind sprouts again. And its seeds lodge in the tiniest encouraging cracks. It flourishes in good soul, soil. The danger of pride is that it feeds on goodness. Good intentions. So we looked at the definition. Now let's look at the characteristics of pride. We're still on point number one, the problem of pride. First we saw it defined. Now we see the characteristics of pride. Y'all still with me on this Sunday night? All right, I got a couple of you left. I want you to see this first. It is deceptive. We don't ever go to this chapter, but Obadiah. Obadiah chapter number 1 verse number 3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee that thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock whose habitation is high that saith in his heart who shall bring me down to the ground. Characteristics of pride first is it is deceptive. And these deceptive powers they have the ability to, to blind us to the truth. You may, well, I'll just use myself for an example. There's, I, I like, there's a singer called Joseph Habedank, and I love, I love to hear him sing. I also love to hear Kenny Rogers, okay? I'm just going to be honest with you. And I've sat in the car, and I've listened to both, Kenny Rogers, and their, their voices are opposite ends of the spectrum. But man, I get in, Brother Terry, I get in the car, and I put on Joseph Habedank. He'll be singing The Beauty of the Blood or something like that. I sound just like him. Sound just like it. And I'm thinking, I'm going to call Day Wind and I'm going to get me a record deal. I'm, I sound, and then I turn over and I put on the gambler. You got to know in the whole. And I said, man, I could give Kenny a run for his money. I'm telling you, I sound just like him. You know what that is? That's pride. Because if I played the same two songs in front of y'all and sang them, Y'all be like, you need to go ahead and stop. Because you don't sound like either one of them. Now that sounds silly. We giggle. But that's, that's the deceptiveness of pride. It makes us blind to the truth. I don't know who plays ball in here or not. But have you ever been on a ball field behind that chain link fence or on the bleacher? And your kids got 47 left feet and they're trying their best to, they're, tr- they're trying to dribble the ball down to the end zone to make a home run. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, they're, they just, they don't have a choice. They, they don't have a chance. And they're, they're going and, whoo, go ahead. That's my baby right there. The best on the, on the field, the best on the, the court. And mama sitting next to you. <laughs> Oh, I wish they'd get out. I, I wish they'd pull them out. Pride blinds us to the truth. Truth is, your youngin can't play ball. But because you have pride, that's your child. That's your son. That's your daughter. You're blind to that. And so you understand, it's innocent. There's nothing wrong with being proud of your child. But it still is deceptive. It's deceptive, deceptive powers are the birth, birthplace of rebellion. Let's look at this. It is not only deceptive, but it is destructive. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before fall. I wasn't going to read this just because of the, the, the nature of it, but I read this illustration that I found. During the Battle of the Wilderness in the Civil War, a Union general named John Sedgwick was inspecting his troops. At one point he came to a to an overlook and he gazed out into the direction of the enemy and his officers suggested that this was unwise and perhaps he ought to take cover. While passing this overlook. The general snapped and said nonsense. They couldn't hit 
an elephant at this dist. Y'all can fill in the blank there. Before finishing the sentence, he fell to the ground, mortally wounded. See, he thought he had an advantage. He thought he was far enough away not to be touched by the enemy. He thought he was safe because of his own army. But he failed because of the destructive power of pride. Psalm 29 verse 23, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. The giant of pride, we talked a little bit yesterday, I believe it was at Bible study, that testimony is one of the most precious possessions a child of God can ever have. But pride will destroy your testimony. It will do that because it is deceptive, but also because it is destructive. It destroys your service. Now, I'm going to use Miss Denise's family, and I don't, they have not complained at all. You ain't complained to me. You might have complained behind closed doors, but not to me. But I've cleaned a church before, and I know it's not an easy job. Church folks is nasty. Okay? And I'm not, I'm not just being funny. I'm trying to make a point here. But and I don't know how long they've cleaned the church. And I realize other people during special meetings clean it as well. But generally speaking, they clean this church every single week. They do the trash, the vacuum and the sweep and mop and whatever needs to be done. They take care of those things. But if they are not careful, and I say they, Miss Denisha and her kids, Brother Stanley is in, he'll help them. If they are not careful, they can allow pride to come into their hearts and they'll say, why am I cleaning this toilet? I watch the same man go in the same stall and leave a mess every time. Why am I cleaning these pews? I watch the same pew have little bits and and I'm... The same pew has little bits of paper left every single week. The same pew has water bottles left here every week. I'm eat up about them water bottles. I ain't going to lie to you. The same pew leaves a mess every week. If they ain't careful, those that pride can get in and they'll get to where, well, I ain't going to clean that pew. Or I'm not going to, I'm not going to do as good a job as I used to. And it will ruin their service. It will destroy their service. Brother David, he does a lot. He teaches Sunday school and maybe, maybe Brother Jody's got a new class. Miss, uh, Abby's got a new class. Denisha, Miss, uh, uh, Kim's got a class. And maybe, maybe the, just the crowd goes down. And, and it, it's, maybe Miss Abby, she only has one or two kids start coming. Something happens and for a month, you only got one kid. And you say, man, is it really worth it? And, and you'll begin to entertain that thought. And you'll begin to entertain thoughts like, well, I, I spend, and, and I mentioned Brother David, and he'd fall in this too. All the teachers would fall into this. But I spent all week long, or I've spent the last two weeks or whatever, studying and making preparation, getting the right things together because of my class that's going to be here. And they, they said they're going to be here. They said they're going to be on time. And now look, for the last month, they've not been here. And, and I've just had one child. It's just a waste. I'm going to quit. Am I telling it right, church? Only about five or six of y'all would know I'm telling it right. Because that's how many teachers we got. What about singers? Same thing. Get up here and you, you, you've, you've practiced. You've done everything you know to do. You feel like you do a good job. Nobody says amen. Nobody raises their hand. Nobody acknowledges that you're even breathing up there behind the microphone. Is it really worth it? If we're not careful, pride will creep in. And it will destroy our service. Husbands, wives, it will destroy your marriage. We could spend a whole nother month dealing about how it destroys a marriage. Pride. Whether that good morning kiss, that good night kiss, or any of those hours in between, pride 
can destroy a marriage. Destroys your peace. We mentioned this morning that God gives us peace that passeth all understanding. But if we're not careful, we'll allow pride to creep into our hearts and where we could normally, we could normally kind of go beyond the, the words that are said or, or the things that are done to offend us. And we normally have peace. If we're not careful, we have pride and we'll begin to say things like, well, they don't know who I am. Or they'll begin to say, they don't know what all I do. I almost ran a rabbit right there. I'm not even going to do it. It will destroy your usefulness. Pride will get you to the point where you just don't do anything. There's a a godly contentment. And then there's a, a human contentment. Godly contentment is good. Human contentment is bad. Paul says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He, that's not God, that's not human contentment. He says, wherever God leads me, whatever God wants me to do, I'm going to be satisfied. I'm going to be content in that. But if, again, this statement has, has just repeated itself. If pride creeps into our heart, this giant of pride, where we should have godly contentment, we begin to transition to human contentment. And we're content to only do so much. Or we're content to go to church only these times. We're content only to give this amount. We're content only, you catch the phrasing, only to do. But godly contentment will allow us to do and do and do. It will destroy our usefulness. And in all of those things, testimony, service, your marriage, your peace, your usefulness, guess what that will do? That will destroy a church. Pride will destroy a church. Pride will say things like, Well, I think we're good right here. We don't need any more people to come in. We don't need people like that to come into the church. We don't need this, this group of people to come into the church. They may ruin the, the, the church if we allow them. I know what they've done. We don't want that type of person. Honey, if you say that, you need to hit this altar. Come on. I'm going to amen my own self right there. Because if it were not for the grace of God, we'd be in the same boat. It's destructive, it's deceptive, it's devouring. Uh, I'm going to give you this when I stop. We'll pick up next time. It's devouring. Jeremiah chapter number 50, verse 32. And the most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise him up. And I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it shall devour all round about him. This fire will devour. But why? Because of the proud. And they've stumbled. And they've fall, fallen. Benjamin Franklin said, There is perhaps no one of our natural passions so hard to subdue as pride. He, he went on he said, Beat it down. Stifle it. Mortify it as much as one pleases. It is still alive. Even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I should probably be proud of my humility. Let that just air out for a little bit. Let's read that phrase again. Benjamin Franklin said, Even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I should probably be proud of my humility. Have you ever been so humble you got proud? I think we need to go back to the drawing board. Just kind of a 
a simple little illustration. I don't know what they're called. I call them a bull ant. I don't know what they are. A little ant, about an inch long, and about, near about big as your pinky finger. Not a Smith pinky finger, but a normal person's pinky finger. And I've been in the in the dirt, and I've tried my best to smash that thing. And I mean, I get all and I. Y'all got those over there? Y'all know what I'm talking about? In, in cow, cow, cow ant. Bless God. Them things, they're from a different country or something. Else. And I've get, I've, I mean, I've dug in the ground and that thing, I'm like, I got him. And he'll say, what's up, y'all? <laughs> I mean, he just come right up. A couple months back, I was cutting the grass or mowing the yard, however you want to say it. And one come across the concrete. My hand up, I smashed it on the concrete. And it shook my foot off like it was nothing. That's what pride does. You, Benjamin Franklin said, you can beat it down, you can stifle it, you can try to smother it, but as much as you think you have, just the least little bit, it'll come back to life. So this giant of pride, I, 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 wanna, I, I think I'll end and begin each message as we go on with this. The question is not, does this giant exist in my life? But rather, where does this giant exist in my life? So there's more to come. We're going to deal with it being divisive. We'll deal with the power of humility for every giant. We have to have we have to have something to fight it with. And so to fight pride, we have to have humility. And so we'll deal with that next, next Sunday, I believe.